Welcome to Calvary. It's so good to see each one of you today. So good to worship with you. All of you who are here, you online, it's a joy to worship our great God with you. You know, I thought that baptism was awesome, didn't you? What a testimony. That was a testimony. It was amazing. And God is doing some great things and some lives. It's just so exciting. You know, this is a Memorial Day weekend, and it's not just a time to kick back, but it's also a time to remember and reflect. Friday, I had a funeral for Gary Little, who went home to heaven, and <clears throat> Gary was uh, uh, in the Navy, served at USS Kitty Hawk, um, uh, a flat top, you know, aircraft carrier during Vietnam War, and we had all the military salutes and everything at the, it was beautiful, and so many of you have people to remember. And, and uh, so I just want to encourage you along that line at this time of the year. Um, you know, I also want to celebrate with you. I don't know if you caught it on the clip a while ago, but we had Give to Lincoln, and it just ended this last week, and it just blew me away because you and our folk gave... $50,000 to Parkview Christian School. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> what a victory. God just continues to do amazing things, and he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. What a great God, and we are thankful. We've been in a series on grace, and all of it has been from the Old Testament. From the OT, we've been looking at God's grace, and... Uh, and so next week, I decided to do one. We're wrapping up the Old Testament this week, today. But next Sunday, I want to do one from the New Testament. Now, the New Testament ought to be a series like these eight we've doing, we're doing from the Old Testament. We ought to do eight or more. But we just have one Sunday. So we're going to, I picked the best thought. It's from the Gospel of John. And I'm so excited to share it with you next Sunday. I think you'll... You'll be really excited about this and God's grace from the New Testament. But we see God's grace all through the Bible, do we not? He is a gracious God. And we have been seeing this Sunday by Sunday. We, we saw law and grace. We looked at that a couple Sundays, law and grace, and how they, law is an expression of God's grace. We're not saved by the law, but it is given to us to protect us and help us to be a success and to prosper in life. And so we're saved by grace for Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It's not on the screen, but I'm just talking here. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. The gift of God. God's salvation is a gift. It is not something I merit. It is not something I earn. It, 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 no, it is a gift. I just receive it. God's salvation is by grace. For by grace are you saved. And we spent a lot of time on it because it's a foreign concept to us. We, we struggle with this concept of grace. It's not something that it's just natural for us. And so, and, and, and so we have to really understand it and work at it. And most people just don't get it when it comes to grace. And so... And not only is it salvation by grace, but if you were with us, you saw in Abraham, in David, in Rahab, and, uh, and, and today you'll see in Jonah, God's grace working with people, not only in salvation, but even working continually. Not only are we saved by grace, but we live by grace. And God continues to put up with me by grace. You know, if I was God, I'd have said, you're, you're done, dude. You know, you're done. <laughs> You've messed up enough. <laughs> and God didn't do that with Abraham, as we saw. He could have done it with David. He didn't do that. And, and, and so, God's grace is amazing. As John Newton wrote, amazing grace. And uh, it is amazing. And, and uh, it, it, it's the story of the Bible. The story of the Bible is a story of grace. A gracious God. 
Yes, he's a God of justice, and yes, there's judgment, and, but God has made a provision. God has made provision. My sin demands payment. He is a God of justice. It must be paid for. But he paid for it for me. So I receive that payment. That's called grace. That's called grace. What a great, great God of grace. And so next week we'll do one on New Testament. And then the following week, two weeks from today, Calvary Community Church will be 48 years old. And so we'll do a, a birthday message on that Sunday on June the 13th. And then on Monday the 14th, Monday night, we have a special meeting here, it's very special, and uh, <clears throat> we will have a time of fellowship and a little box supper, nothing big fancy, but just something. And uh, so if you, if you would like to come, you can put it on the card, let us know. So we just need to know who's coming. And uh, so uh, I have some very important things, announcements, things. The best is yet to come. I want you to know that. Some great things are coming. And I'm so, so thrilled and so excited about the wonderful things our God is doing. The story of Jonah is a historical story. Some people say, well, you don't really believe that story, do you? You're looking at it, buddy. I believe it. You know why I believe it? Because Jesus believed it. Jesus referred to Jonah as a historical character. And so I believe this happened. And you believe a fish swallows me? Yes, I do. And you know what? The Bible's full of miracles. And if you start explaining the miracles away, and, and you, you, you just have too small a God. I have a big God. And he can do amazing things. And so we're looking at this wonderful story of Jonah today. Little four-chapter letter, a book, and in the Old Testament. And the enemy to the north of Israel was Assyria. And uh, the, cap the capital of Assyria was Nineveh, uh, Nineveh, the city of Nineveh. And God told well, let's just read it. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittah, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up against me. The people of Syria were very wicked. They were cruel. They were vicious. They redefined torture. I mean, they were not good people, bad people, and they were hated by the Jews, by the Israelites, because they were their enemy, and eventually Assyria would conquer the 10 northern tribes in 722 BC, but this was long before that, and Jonah hated them, and Jonah wanted them punished, and they were, they were, they were the enemies of Israel, and God said, I want you to go, and I want you to bring a message to the people of Nineveh. Jonah wanted nothing to do with it. Verse 3. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. <laughs> Nineveh is uh, north and east of where Jonah lived, of Israel. 500 miles. If you look on a map, it's up and to the right, which is east. <laughs> and Jonah got on a ship to go west across the Mediterranean to Tarshish, which is, which is uh, 2,400 miles west. It's on the southern coast of Spain. <laughs> and couldn't be farther from the will of God. And so he is running from God. And you can run from God, but you cannot outrun God. And that's what we see today. And we runners have this little saying that all runners are running from something. <laughs> and, and, and we all, <laughs> there are days when you just go and run because maybe you're hurting or maybe you, and, uh, and, and it helps. But, but Jonah's running from God. And he gets on this ship and there's a terrible storm, as you know. And we read it in verse 9. 
a terrible storm, and they uh, finally they talked to Jonah. They, they actually cast lots. This was customary in those days. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Who's, who's responsible? Who's God angry at? And the lot fell on Jonah. And so uh, Jonah said to them, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord. I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. This made them all the more fearful. They said, oh my. And they said, what should we do to calm this storm? And they said, uh, because the storm was increasing, not, not subsiding. And, and so uh, they're trying to figure out, what do we do? And they rode, hard, uh, rode harder and harder trying to, to uh, get to shore. And, uh, and Jonah said, just throw me overside. Pick me up, throw me in the sea, and the sea will become, become calm <laughs> because I'm the reason for this storm. Well, they, they didn't do it right away. They kept trying to battle it. And finally, they said, okay. And it was suicide by sailor. <laughs> they cast Jonah into the sea. And uh, you can imagine, uh, into the raging sea, Jonah goes. But we see in verse 17 that God rescues him. The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. And this is what Jesus referred to as Jonah was in the belly of the fish. So the son of man, and he compares, this is a a foreshadowing, he says. But God commanded a fish. Isn't that something? You believe God can command a fish? (laughs) I think God's in charge of it all, don't you? I mean, Jesus did that. I mean... He said, uh, cast the nets. You know, I know know you fished all night, didn't catch anything, but cast the nets. And they did, and they couldn't bring them in for all the fish. (laughs) And I think Jesus said, all right, all you fish, get over here. You know, (laughs) another time he said, cast the nets on the right side, and they cast it, and they couldn't hardly be. And, you know, God can do. My God is not limited. And, And so here's Jonah in the belly of the fish. And we call it the whale. We don't know, but uh, it could have been a whale for sure. And uh, what did he do? He did what you and I would do. He prayed. (laughs) He's calling on God. Why was he in that fish three days and three nights? Did it take him that long to repent? I don't think so. I don't think it took him long, but it took him a while to maybe really learn the lesson that he needed to learn. And so he's calling out, and he, he calls out to God, and from the belly of the fish, I called out of my distress to the Lord, and he answered me. I cried for help. This is Jonah calling on God. Cried out out of my distress. Have you ever done that? Sure you have. I've done that. Oh, God. Oh, God. My back's against a wall. God, if you don't do something, I'm in trouble. God. And he calls out to God. And he answered me. He says, God answers prayer. In his own time, in his own way, but God answers prayer. And it's an amazing thing. And Jonah sees it. And God is call, uh, Jonah is calling on God. And the purpose of God's discipline is not to pay Jonah back. It is to bring him back. He is bringing Jonah back to his will. This is God's grace too, by the way, is it not? I mean, if I was God, I'd have said, so long, buddy. You know, you don't want to do my will, then just drown. (laughs) But God is giving him a second chance. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? God's a God of a second chance, third chance, fourth chance. I don't know. (laughs) But God is gracious. God is working in Jonah's life. And I want you to know that discipline is not pleasant. When God brings discipline in my life, in your life, it is not something we maybe enjoy. No, no. Whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, Hebrews 12 says. But it is appreciated later because God has a way of working in your life and working in my life to help us to not only know him, but to be transformed and to discover his 
purpose for our lives and these things. And so God is working. And this is God's grace. God is working with a difficult person named Jonah. And we've seen God work with difficult people as we've looked at the Old Testament. He worked with Abraham. I'd have cut him right off. Whew. He worked with David. I sure would have cut him off. You know, He worked with Rahab. We see him working with people. But aren't you glad that God continues to work? Because if God was not gracious, he would have cut me off a long time ago. He would have cut you off a long time ago. But God is working. He works with difficult people. Jonah's prayer continues as he calls on God. For you have cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea. The current has engulfed me. He's describing what's going on. Lord, I'm just overwhelmed with my situation, God. Have you been there? And God gives him a second chance. We see it here in verse 10. Look at what God does. Then the Lord commanded the fish. I like that, don't you? <laughs> the Lord commanded the fish. It vomited jo Jonah up into the dry land. <laughs> oh, my. It's not real pretty, but it happened. And Jonah gets a second chance. A second chance to do what God had called him to do. To do the will of God. Does he do it? Yes, he does it. Is his heart in it? No, it's not. His heart is not in it, but he does it because he, he has to. And he goes to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a, was a city of significant size. Archaeologists have found miles of wall that were around Nineveh. It was, it was a city of 120,000 people, and it had surrounding suburbs, villages, and, and, and a lot of people. And he goes to Nineveh to take the message of God to Nineveh. And we see it in the third chapter of this little book. Jonah says, that he begins to go through the city a day's walk. And he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And he's preaching God's judgment. God's going to bring judgment on this place. You're wicked people. And I think he's preaching it almost from a heart of glee. You know, I'm excited. I'm excited because you people are going to get judged and you deserve it. <laughs> That's where he's at. And you'd think people would certainly not respond to that kind of preaching. <laughs> but they do. This is amazing. And it, 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 uh, why would they... And we don't know for sure. I did quite a bit of reading about it this week, and historians say that there were several things that happened that could have primed these people for the message of God. One was there was an eclipse of the sun just prior to Jonah's coming, and the sun grew black. That was one, that was, ancient people were very fearful of such things. Another was there was marauding tribes, marauding bands north of Nineveh, and, 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 and they were moving their way, and they were fearful. A third thing was this. In the last five years before Jonah had come there, there had been two plagues. Many people lost their lives. Two COVID-19s. Well, something like that. And, and so the people were receptive now, isn't that amazing to me? It's amazing to me when I realize that because, you know, sometimes you, you think I'm sharing the truth of God and, and nobody's going to respond. But you know what? You never know. And, you, and, and, and God has you here for a reason today. And I don't know exactly how he's prepared your heart for what he has for you. And I don't know what, what you're going through, what your situation is, what, but God does. God does, and I've seen it again and again. He brings me to a situation, and then he brings the message, and oh my, I, I, I've just seen it again and again. I mean, I, I, I've been going through something, and somebody gives me a book. It was the exact thing I needed for that time. 
And I look back and I literally get goosebumps thinking about it. How, what a coincidence. I love God's coincidence, don't you? I just love his coincidence. You know, it's the hand of God, I'm telling you. I have seen it again and again. And, 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 and you may be saying, well, I just happen to be in church. And, and, and no, God had you there. And the people of Nineveh could have said, well, it just happened this crazy guy Jonah who came through town was preaching. And no, God was working. And that's God's way. God is gracious, and he is gracious to you. He is gracious to us. He is working in your life. He's not done. And so Jonah comes and he preaches to this big city of Nineveh. And I want you to see this little statement that I have for you. Grace without truth is meaningless. Truth without grace is mean. Grace without truth is meaningless. If all I talked about was the grace of God and never told you also the, the hard truth that goes with it, you'd never, it'd be meaningless. The hard truth is this. I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. There's a penalty on our sin. Either we pay it or we receive God's grace. And so without the truth, grace is meaningless. It, but truth without grace is mean, and that's where Jonah was. Jonah's just going to give you the truth. This, this city is under the judgment of God. <laughs> he, he doesn't want to go any farther than that. Jonah is mean. I'm glad I'm never mean. Are you mean? <laughs> I'm real good at giving grace. I'm good at giving grace to those I feel deserve it. Those that are nice to me, those that are kind to me, I'm, I'm going to give them all kinds of grace. But what about your enemy? What about those who hurt you? What about those who do you bad? This is the kind of people that God is calling Jonah to give grace to. This is the kind of people that you and I sometimes are not real good at giving grace to. And maybe somebody's coming to your mind right now that you're thinking about it. You're saying, man, I just can't rejoice over any good thing happening to them. Whew. They don't deserve no good. I'm telling you, he's a bad person. She's a bad... And, 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 and we just don't want to give them grace. When I'm full of truth alone... I mean, I mean, and that's not God. Now, here's the amazing thing. Here's the amazing thing. The people of Nineveh repented. They repented. And God forgave them. And Jonah was furious. He is so ticked off. He is so angry. We see it in chapter 4. <laughs> Look at this. He prayed to the Lord. Look at his prayer. Please, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my own country? In other words, I told you so, God. <laughs> Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents concerning calamity. Look at what he says about God. God is compassionate. God is abundant in loving kindness. Gracious, gracious, full of grace. That's why I didn't want to bring this message to these people. I was afraid you would be gracious to them. I didn't want that. He is very angry with God. He's fine with grace as long as it's toward him. Am I that way? Are you that way? I love God's grace as long as it's for me. I love God's grace, Jonah said, as long as it's for my people, Israel. I don't want it for Assyria. I don't want it for our enemy.
But the strange thing is, God doesn't just love me, us. He loves them. He loves not just Israel. He loves Assyria. He loves people that maybe you don't love. Maybe I don't want to love. He loves my enemy. He loves your enemy. And now I want you to see him begin to work not only with the people of Nineveh, but he works with his messenger, Jonah. God is so patient. Look at this in verses 5. Then Jonah went from the city and sat east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. Jonah's not convinced these people really repented. He's not convinced they're really sincere. So he goes up on the hilltop on the east of the city. And he's going to watch. Maybe God will bring judgment. And he's waiting. And so here's what God does. He appoints a plant and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. It's hot. The sun's bearing down. Jonah was so happy about the plant. But God appointed a worm. God's even in charge of the worms. Don't you like this? I like it. When dawn came the next day and it attacked the plant and it withered. <laughs> when the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on, Jonah, on Jonah's head so that he became faint and he begged with his soul saying, death is better to me than life. <laughs> and God speaking to Jonah look at this God said do you have a good reason to be angry about the plant and Jonah said you did sure know I do well I just paraphrased it but here's what I have good reason to be angry angry even to death <laughs> he is really upset <laughs> and now look how the Lord deals with him you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work, which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh? There's his question. Should I not have compassion? You had compassion on this gourd, on this plant that brought you shade, that brought you comfort. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, God says? The great city, and there are more than 120,000 people who do not know the difference between their right hand, their left hand, is, and, and many animals as well. God says, Jonah, you could have compassion over what affected you and brought you comfort in life and over the loss of that, but what about the people? What about the people of Nineveh? God is challenging Jonah with the focus of his concern. Because his concern is the plant. His concern is his comfort. God's concern is people. Is people. That's what God is concerned about. People. This is God's, God's program is people. It is. It is people. For God so loved the world, the mountains and the lakes and the... No, no, no. The people. The people. It's all about people. God's program can be said in one word, people. Go into all the world and preach the good news to people. It's all about people. One thing matters to God. Jesus died for people. This is the hard part for Jonah. You see, receiving grace is easier than giving grace. Now, receiving grace, we have to learn that, and we've been looking at it for Sunday after Sunday, because for by grace are you saved, and we need to understand it's by grace. But also, also, we must learn that when we come to know God, and we, God wants to transform us so that we're more like Him, and that we will give grace. 
Not just receive, but give grace. You see, Jonah's religion was all about Jonah. His faith was all about him. Not sharing with others God's grace. He was so thankful for God's grace in his life and his people, but he didn't want other people to have it, especially those who were so-called bad people. Jonah surrendered to the will of God, but not to the purpose of God. The purpose of God is people. It is people. That's the purpose of God. People. We pastors have this little saying that we say with tongue in cheek, the ministry would be great if it wasn't for people. And of course, we're being facetious because the ministry is people. But sometimes people drive you nuts, do they not? Right? And you have somebody in your life, you work with them or you live with them behind your front door. I don't know. <laughs> and they need grace, and you don't want to give them grace. You don't want to give them. You know, we, we have this other little saying opposites attract. Is that true? Opposites attract. Yeah, it is true. I dare say, if you're married, you probably know that. My wife and I are different as night and day. She's a night owl. I'm a morning person. She's wrong about so many things. I'm right about everything. <laughs> oh, yeah. But you know what? Opposites opposites and, you, and isn't that true this is what attracted you in the beginning you saw things strengths that you don't have and you admired them and it was so wonderful and you became friends or you beca and you became co-workers or you became husband or whatever and then as time went along it's not op opposites attract it's opposites attack <laughs> because you begin to say well, why don't they whatever, you know, just like me. And we like people just like us. And we don't like people that are not like us. And they don't have our strengths. And we say, what's wrong with them? But they have these other strengths that are so beautiful, but we lose sight. And we don't want to be gracious anymore. And God is calling us to not only receive grace, but give grace. Those are the two sides to grace, receiving and giving. Grace has two sides, receive and extend or give. And that's what God has for you and me. We have looked at grace now for eight Sundays, and we see it. And God is so gracious. And you know what? Sometimes I'm not. And I think he's so disappointed. God is calling you. God is calling me to be gracious. To be gracious. But he doesn't deserve it, Pastor Carl. You don't know what he did. She doesn't deserve it. You don't know what she did. God is calling you to be gracious. And he's so patient to work with Jonah. When Jonah was basically a jerk, you won't forget that, will you? Jonah the jerk? <laughs> I just thought of it. It's pretty good, isn't it? But sometimes we're the same way. And God is saying, I want you to be gracious. People need grace. God is gracious. Our Heavenly Father... We bow before you today asking you to help us to be gracious in difficult situations. Lord, maybe there's someone here today who behind their front door they need to be gracious or where they work or with their friends, their family. Somebody, please help us, God change our hearts, work in our lives, help us to be gracious, loving and kind like you. 
Perhaps you would say to me, Pastor Carl, I have yet to receive that grace. I know I'm a sinner. I, I, I agree with God's book. And I, 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 I need a Savior. I just want you to know God is so gracious. If you in your heart where you sit would just call out to God now, right now, and say, God, I need Jesus. I need the grace. I need your forgiveness. If you will invite him and receive the gift of eternal life, I'm telling you today can be the red letter day of your life. For God loves you more than Pastor Carl could tell you. Pray with me, dear God. Thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you, dear God. Help us as we continue to learn about you and continue to work in our hearts, please. I pray that everyone would have a relationship with you and know you. Thank you, dear God. Thank you so much. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Let's just give God a big hand for his grace, can we? God bless you.